we're going to come to God's Word, and we're going to read together um, from Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 to 15, and we come uh, to the final part in our Shalom series this morning. And these are the words of Jesus. You find these in the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And as we think about the shalom that you want to bring in our lives for this last time in our series, we pray, Lord, that we'll hear what you want to say to us. We will hear these words about forgiveness and you'll help us not only to hear them, but to bring you glory in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let me begin with two contrasting responses to forgiveness. And first is, is quite a well-told story of Gordon Wilson of Enniskillen, Northern Ireland. His daughter Marie was killed in the Remembrance Day bomb in 1987. He was with her when the bomb went off. The interview he gave to the BBC immediately afterwards went as follows. I said, are you all right, dear? But we were under six feet of rubble. Three or four times I asked her, she always said, yes, I'm all right. I asked her the fifth time, are you all right, Marie? She said, Daddy, I love you very much. Those were the last words she spoke to me. I kept shouting, Marie, are you all right? There was no reply. I have lost my daughter, but I bear no ill will. I bear no grudge. Dirty sort of talk is not going to bring her back to life. Amazing story of, of forgiveness. In contrast, Vicar Stephen Cherry recalls quite a different reaction. He writes this, he says, I was sitting in an empty church with the mother of a boy who had been murdered a few days previously. Four people had just turned themselves into the police. I don't have to forgive them, do I? She whispered, holding my hand. It's too early, far too early to be thinking of forgiveness, I said, squeezing her hand and hoping that the police family support officers would come back into the church to bring the conversation to an end, thinking that this was long enough with the vicar. I confessed that it was psychology and not theology or ethics that had come to my rescue. My advice had boiled down to suggesting that forgiveness takes time. Last week we were thinking about shalom in terms of healing from past wounds. I suggested two things that could help us to experience God's healing, God's shalom from past wounds. And last week we looked at this idea of right thinking, thinking uh, in the way that, that God thinks, thinking um, about God correctly and thinking about ourselves correctly. That's really helpful when we, we have those wounds from the past. But today we want to think about forgiveness because this also is a way of finding healing from past wounds. To begin with, it's helpful to think about different levels of hurt and offence. There are those very trivial things, the slight things that people might do to us. We might, someone might bump into us, perhaps accidentally, as we pass them in the street. Someone might forget to return a book that they borrowed. And it's pretty clear there, we forgive as we have been forgiven. And then there are perhaps more serious things. Uh, you're let down by someone again and again. They've made promises and they've not kept them. Or, or someone takes something that belongs to you. Someone steals your phone. Th these things may hurt, they may be inconvenient, they may be annoying, but these things don't actually cause us significant distress. It's pretty simple. We forgive as we have been forgiven. But then if we, we go further on to significant hurt, significant offence, uh, we're cheated on. Our spouse has had an affair. Uh, we are bullied, not just once, but systematically. Someone has it against us at work and, and they belittle us over and over again and, and this causes us damage, serious damage. Forgiveness is now more difficult and it probably requires more than a one-off decision. The wounds are deep. Forgiveness is, is a more complex thing which is going to take time. And if we go even uh, further in our grading here, we go now to shattering hurt. 
where we are severely damaged by others. Life now is difficult to continue with because of what they have done to us. Our life is shaped by their actions towards us. And we might think about those huge things, maybe abuse or murder or rape or torture, or or we're a victim of a terrorist attack. And forgiveness is not a switch we can just turn on at these points. This is a really deep thing. The wounds are deep. And it might be something as well that we shouldn't think is so easy and so straightforward. It's these latter categories of deeper hurt that I want to focus on today, where the wounds are deep. And I want to ask the question, do we need to forgive? If so, how do we forgive? And what does forgiveness look like? I mentioned Stephen Cherry a moment ago. He um, has written a book called Healing Agony. It's interesting putting those two words together, that actually healing comes through an agonizing process when it comes to forgiveness. And he describes forgiveness as a slow, deep, enigmatic, unpredictable, and vulnerable venture. Now, you could spend time on each of those words as he does in the book, but, but it is not a straightforward thing. There's no certainty of finding closure, finding complete healing when the wounds are so deep. There's no guarantee also where the venture might take you. He says the problem is that the truth about forgiveness is darker, more difficult, and infinitely more agonizing than the myths about forgiveness which people, not least Christian people, prefer to promulgate. As C.S. Lewis said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Lewis was writing just seven years after the end of World War II in response to people wanting to ask him how he would feel about forgiving the Nazis if he were a Pole or a Jew. For minor offences, forgiveness is easier. It's easy, it's commanded. We must forgive as we've been forgiven. But for events that turn our lives upside down, that cause damage to us, deep damage, that even shatter who we are, forgiveness is a much more complex issue and is far from easy to do. And it's not very helpful to demand that someone forgives another person, to put pressure on them. It's much more helpful to, I think, think about a direction of travel and openness towards that possibility, moving into God's purposes, into his kingdom purposes on this venture of forgiveness. Because actually, sometimes this is a lifelong struggle where the hurt has been so deep. I like what Tom Wright says in commentating upon Matthew 6, the verses that we we have as our text this morning. He talks about having open doors and closing doors rather than having forgiveness as a duty or a command. And he says if we leave the door open to forgiving others, even if we can't do so yet, we actually then leave the door open to receiving God's forgiveness. But if we slam the door shut and say never, then we may be slamming the door shut on the possibility that we will receive God's forgiveness. So how do we forgive? I want to talk about three things that can help someone venture towards forgiveness, even if this is enormously difficult. And the first one is around the issue of justice. Forgiveness does not mean denying justice. It does not mean forgetting what has happened. It does not mean condoning it or excusing it or tolerating someone's sin. It doesn't mean we turned a blind eye to the injustice that has happened, that we pretend sin is not sin, that evil is not evil. Forgiveness begins by recognizing and acknowledging the offense. Father Michael Lapsley a priest from South Africa, was sent a letter bomb during the apartheid era that when it exploded, blew off his hands, burst his eardrums and blinded him in one eye. He's on record as saying that he cannot forgive those who bombed him because I do not know who they are. He goes on to say that even if they identified themselves, confessed and were full of sorrow, it wouldn't be right to let them walk free. They should at least take responsibility for all the extra help he needs just to get through daily life. Forgiveness is not about pretending there are no consequences resulting from the offence or even denying that the offence was committed. Forgiveness begins by ascertaining that something needs to be forgiven by recognising that people need to be held to account, that people are responsible for their actions and that their actions are not to be tolerated or excused. 
Therefore, if someone is being harmed, if someone is being abused at this moment, actually the, the right response is not simply to say, well, it doesn't matter, I'll tolerate this. The right response is to call out the sin, to put an end to the sin, to, to, to name it as it is. The process of forgiveness begins by holding the person to account. We might perhaps say words are a little bit, um, move a little bit on this issue, but we might want to draw a line maybe between forgiveness and pardon. If forgiveness is a personal response, but pardoning is that actually to pardon someone, if we think about that as, as what the state requires of someone. It might be someone is personally forgiven, but actually still need to face the consequences of their actions. On a related but separate issue, I just want to touch on this, because I quoted Gordon Wilson earlier, whose daughter Marie was killed by the IRA bombing in Enniskillen. Let me now quote Aileen, Qu Aileen Quinton, whose mother Alberta was also killed in the same attack. She railed against the idea of forgiving the attackers, saying in the aftermath of the attack, to me it is morally indefensible to forgive people who aren't sorry. It's an important and interesting question. Can we forgive the unrepentant? Do we need an apology first before forgiveness can be offered? I think around this that there's a difficulty if we only forgive when the other person admits that they are wrong. If the, on, only, uh, the other person says that they're sorry. Because the victim then is actually reliant on the one who's damaged them in order to be able to venture towards forgiveness. They're entrapped by this situation. They can't make progress towards a place of forgiveness and release unless they're allowed to do so by the person who's caused them injury in the first place. I think we can begin to venture towards forgiveness even when no apology is offered and no remorse is expressed. But we do so not denying justice and saying that the behavior is okay or excusing them from the consequence of their actions. So that's the first, uh, first area. Let me move on to a second area about what might help as we venture towards forgiveness. And I think, and this is really difficult, allowing ourselves to empathize. One of the protections that we put up against those who've hurt us is often to put distance between ourselves and them. Not, not physical distance, but emotional difference or psychological difference. Maybe even to see them as different from us. A different kind of being. They are inhuman, they are evil. Our, our media often does this when there's a, uh, an atrocity that happens. Pumla Gabodo Madikazela is a clinical psychologist who supported the widows of three black policemen murdered by Eugene de Kock during the apartheid in South Africa. Since the widows wanted to meet de Kock, she also began to visit him to gain an insight into the widow's experience. His crimes were horrific, he had, and he was sentenced to 212 years in prison. To her immense discomfort, however, she found herself at times feeling sorry for him. She writes, I was struggling with part of me that made it possible to identify with de Kock, the evil de Kock, and that de Kock shared some of the positive elements of being human. Reflecting on her experience, she wrote a book. And in it, she argues that it's a necessary step in venturing towards forgiveness that we allow ourselves to see the one who has injured and abused us as a human being like we are. She continues, she, she writes this, one reason we distance ourselves through anger from those who've hurt us or others, we know, is the fear that if we engage them as real people, we will be compromising our moral stance and lowering the entry requirements into the human community. Part of my own struggle in my visits with de Kock stemmed from my fear of stepping into the shoes of a murderer through empathy. This idea of seeing the person who has hurt us and injured us so badly um, as have, having empathy as a human being is a risky and enormously painful process, but it is often part of the healing agony on the venture towards forgiveness. It's easier to regard those who have damaged us as, as different from us. And yet the Bible tells us we're all made of the same stuff. We're all made in God's image. We are all fallen. 
All of us are damaged by others and all of us damage others. All of us are sinned against and all of us sin against others. No one is entirely good and no one is entirely evil. This is a difficult step, but often a crucial step for us to make progress towards forgiveness and therefore towards healing. Let me mention a third and final thing in order to move towards forgiveness. I believe we need to have an ability to look forwards as well as backwards. Hannah Arendt says this, she says, forgiveness is the only way to solve the predicament of irreversibility, to change things. It's the only way. Desmond Tutu says, there is no future without forgiveness. One of the key ways to enable us to move towards forgiveness is having a shalom vision, which we've been talking about over these past few weeks, a belief and a hope for a better existence that God is going to bring about this, this different world, this different future, and he wants to bring it about here and now and start to bring it into our experience through the Lord Jesus Christ. To quote a prayer of Desmond Tutu, we look forward and see that goodness is stronger than evil, Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours through him who loves us. And therefore, forgiveness becomes a contribution to what God is bringing about in his eternal shalom. Our forgiveness is a way of contributing to what God is doing in this world. Stephen Cherry writes, Victim no more, the one who has suffered unjustly, not only survives but triumphs. The triumph is not, however, a triumph over the former persecutor or violator in which one wins and the other loses. It is not the perpetrator who is defeated. Indeed, the perpetrator is offered the opportunity for healing and freedom. It is the heavy, dead, and deadening power of evil that is thwarted by forgiveness. It's not about conquering this person. It's about conquering the evil that is in the world. He ends up by saying the victory is of grace over evil, of empathy over cruelty. The triumph is of healing generosity over alienating meanness. As we look forward, we see that what we are doing is part of something much bigger. And our forgiveness contributes to what God is doing in the world. As we see the Shalom vision, we're empowered to venture towards, further towards forgiveness and we will find healing for ourselves as we do so. Gordon Wilson wrote three years after he lost his daughter at Enniskillen. He said, when I think directly of the people responsible for killing Marie and others, I don't bear them nasty thoughts. I'm certainly not lying in my bed at night worrying about them. As human beings, they have their own bits and pieces to pick up, and it's not for me to think ill of them or to bear them a grudge. The mother of Anthony Walker, who was murdered in Liverpool in 2005, said this, Unforgiveness makes you a victim, and why should I be a victim? Anthony spent his life forgiving. His life stood for peace, love, and forgiveness, and I brought them up that way. I have to practice what I preach. I don't feel any bitterness towards them, really. Truly, all I feel is I feel sad for the family. Forgiveness is possible. But in these life-shattering events that happen to us, where others have deeply injured us, it is difficult, so difficult. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up, and we certainly shouldn't beat others up if we cannot forgive straight away, or for some time. In fact, for some of us, we may not get fully there in our lifetime. But I believe what we're asked to do is to keep the door open to the possibility and allow ourselves to venture on the journey towards forgiveness, this difficult, risky, slow, painful, unpredictable journey. Not denying justice, pretending there's no offense, but as much as we're able and as God helps us to open ourselves to the possibility of seeing the other person as a human being and of catching sight of the shalom vision that God, that that lies ahead, that God has prepared for us. There there are two words in the New Testament for forgiveness. One of them 
is a word. I'm going to say it in Greek. I apologize for this, but it's charisma. It's based on that glorious New Testament word, charis, which is where we translate it, grace. It is an act of grace when we forgive someone. We bestow grace on someone. We give them a free gift. In fact, the English word forgive has the idea of giving to the other person. Even the word par pardon, we talk about a donation, the word don there is about giving to the other person. When we forgive, we give an extraordinary undeserved gift. We give grace to the one who has hurt us so badly and is so undeserving of it. And in so doing, we are participating in God. We are reflecting his coming kingdom. We are announcing his shalom. Forgiveness is our contribution to the coming shalom.